Good morning, um, and welcome back to uh, a Global Neurosciences Institute Grand Rounds. Uh, and now it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Errol Vesantorogu. Dr. Ves is an internationally renowned, comprehensively trained vascular neurosurgeon. He's the director of the Drexel Neurosciences Institute and Robert Groff, chair of Department of Neurosurgery. And he's also president of Global Neurosciences Institute. Dr. Ves's expertise includes the treatment of aneurysms, arteriovenous malformations, stroke, carry malformations, and other potentially fatal conditions of the brain and cerebrovascular conditions. He's widely published and speaks regularly at international conferences, lecture, lecturing extensively on aneurysms, subarachnoid hemorrhage, stroke, and intracranial, intracranial vascular disorders. Dr. Ves will be speaking today about hairy malformation. Dr. Ves. Thank you, uh, Peter. Good morning, everybody, and welcome uh, to Grand Rounds. So um, I thought I would talk about Chiari um, this morning because, first of all, we have five incredible vas dual-trained vascular neurosurgeons who all, um, you know, usually will speak about vascular. And, and Chiari is one of those things that I started doing back uh, when I was actually probably two months into being an attending. Um, at Jefferson, really, because nobody wanted to do them. I kind of got a pat on the back and said, hey, you like doing Chiari surgeries? I'm like, yeah, actually, I enjoy them. So they're like, congratulations, you're now going to take over uh, doing the Chiari program. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why that is. But I think it's important, and I think it's a great Grand Rounds lecture, particularly for our neuroscience Grand Rounds, because if you think about a Chiari patient and the collaboration, um, these are cognitive patients. These are movement disorder patients. These are neuromuscular patients. They're certainly headache patients, um, as well as surgical patients. And the trick is really figuring out who's a surgical candidate and who's not. Um, so let me uh, go forward here. So my disclosures, um, really none relevant other than the bottom two. Um, I'm a board member of um, ASAP, which is a national uh, uh, Chiari support group. Um, and GNI does have a grant from the Siri organization, um, which is a, a group that looks at medical marijuana for certain diseases and uh, through ASAP has received uh, a grant to study medical marijuana in Chiari patients. Um, so this is Chiari um, right here. This is uh, the long and short of it. The cerebellar tonsils, which you can see the red arrow and hopefully my arrow, um, in the technical term, five millimeter of descent, this little tissue right here at the frame and magnum is a carry malformation. So that's my talk. Any questions, I'll be happy to take. Kidding aside, um, this is really what how surgeons look at carry malformations and radiologists diagnose it, and then it goes down the line. I see a lot of these patients um, that have, you know, headaches that are classic migraines. I'll see patients who um, have been in a car accident and they'll see something incidental and this is an incidental finding and you know patients are told they have carry malformation go see a surgeon you need surgery so obviously um, it's a bit more complicated than that and the amount of controversy surrounding carry malformation may surprise many people um, who don't deal with this regularly so the classification um, that's something al always that I know early on um, when I was first learning about Chiari, actually going back to medical school, it was always really confusing. Um, there were up to six variants and there was four variants. So I really want to kind of simplify it into practical terms. So Chiari 1 is the one that most all of us see, um, uh, with the exception of our pediatric colleagues. Uh, Dr. Lovin uh, uh, sees a lot more Chiari 2, um, and we'll talk about that. But Chiari 1 is, is the focus of what my talk is and is the adult form. Chiari 2 is, is basically seen in neonates, um, in children, and this is where the spinal cord is not fully developed. Um, and I'll show you some pictures of that. There's Chiari 3, there's Chiari 4. There's a lot of debate about if Chiari 4 and even Chiari 3 are even real or if they're just an extension of Chiari 2. And as I said, we're not going to get too much into that. Um, but one of the things I do want to talk about, which is a fairly new topic that um, you know, uh, some of particularly the neurologists and some of the neurosurgeons have, may have heard about is uh, Chiari Zero. So what a Chiari Zero is, um, is basically normal MRI. Uh, there's no cerebellar descent. It's a completely normal MRI, but they have Chiari symptoms. 
Um, then there's a Chiari 1.5. Um, these are controversial to say the least. Um, uh, I, I always thought our vascular meetings were very, um, uh, we would argue a lot and there would be a lot of controversy. Um, this puts that to shame. The Chiari Zero um, is very, very controversial. Um, you know, to operate on a patient that has a normal MRI, but symptoms, um, you know, obviously is, is, is a big um, undertaking uh, for really for the patient. And that's why Chiari syndrome is really the new term. People now uh, refer more to Chiari as a whole as a syndrome, whereas the malformation is really an MRI finding. And that's critically important. And, and we'll talk about why that is. Um, and I think it will help when we start to diagnose patients collaboratively, when a neurologist sees a patient for headaches or for ataxia or something like that, they fit into a Chiari syndrome. And then, you know, MRI imaging um, may or may not fit. Um, and you'll see there's lots of variation with that. So the type two, I just want to briefly um, go over because it is something that um, some uh, uh, of us may see in adulthood um, for, uh, as children that present with this. And it's basically failure of the um, embryonic neural folds to meet. Um, most of these kids have a very small posterior fossa, almost universally have hydrocephalus as well, presents in neonates, so it's pretty much you see it at birth, um, and a myelomeningocele you see in 100% of the cases. And this is what this looks like. When I was training at CHOP, we saw a lot of these. CHOP was one of the busiest uh, places um, uh, for this. And if you can see through here, this translucent membrane is, is essentially the arachnoid. This is skin. And if you see in here, this kind of looks like a, like a hot dog bun split down the middle. That's the spinal cord. And those are the neural folds that have not completely come together. And really the, the goal of the surgery is, is to bring those folds together and to close up the skin. And actually at, at CHOP, we did one of the, uh, I was lucky enough, I was a resident, um, Lee Sutton did one of the first in utero cases. So the thought was, while this was diagnosed in utero, basically still in the mother's womb, um, the surgery would be done where a C-section would be performed, the baby would stay um, uh, connected with the umbilical cord, the embryo, would, uh, the baby, the fetus would come out, we would repair the uh, uh, myelomeningocele, and then basically put the baby back in the oven to cook a little bit more, and then there would be a normal delivery. And the idea was that the bathing of the cerebral spinal fluid would uh, uh, hopefully help with preventing cerebral spinal, uh, I'm sorry, uh, hydrocephalus, um, and ultimately hope with uh, lower extremity weakness. And I think that's still kind of ongoing. I know Vanderbilt still does a few, but I don't think, unfortunately, uh, it was a great idea, but I'm not sure that it panned out. Um, maybe Tina can give a talk on that down the road. But for our talk this morning, Really, what I want to focus on is the Chiari one, and you know the essential Chiari diagnosis is the cerebellar tonsils descending below the frame and magnum. Now, there's a range uh, based on age. As we get the cranial vault, um, as we get older, obviously expands and grows, but also as over the age of 30, we start to develop atrophy of the brain. So the amount of descent changes from 10, 30, and then over 80 years uh, uh, old. So the, the the numbers do change. Um, based on the age of uh, the patient. And as we mentioned, you know, five millimeters of descent. Now, is this a Chiari? So if someone has headaches um, and they have five millimeter of descent, do they need surgery? Well, a lot of patients do get surgery. And, and, and I think, unfortunately, um, without the correct diagnosis, without the correct multidisciplinary approach, a lot of people with migraines who happen to have low-lying cerebellar tonsils or even six, seven millimeters of descent um, end up with surgery and obviously the migraine headaches don't get better. Um, so you'll see that uh, um, you know, as more and more kind of collaboration uh, among physicians with Chiari has occurred, we've realized that really size does not matter. Um, and, and another thing that, that is, is I, I think is really important, particularly in this disease, is sitting and standing, um, or I'm sorry, prone or standing on MRI 
this is a dynamic, it's an, a, a very dynamic and not fixed, um, uh, our intracranial uh, vault and the CSF patterns as well as descent. So you can see here on the left, this is a patient sitting and you can see the amount of herniation of the cerebellar tonsils. And then you look at a patient who's lying prone and you can see that's probably about three millimeters difference. So, um, you know, MRIs can, can also clearly vary. So what, what's the triad that we see? So the, the three main things, and again, to, to, to simplify, um, the three things that kind of go together with Chiari and, and all have to be looked at are hydrocephalus, um, herniated cerebellum, like we talked about, cerebellar descent, and then ultimately a syrinx. And so we're gonna kind of talk about all these, all three of these things. And the hydrocephalus and the Chiari malformation really becomes a chicken and an egg because about 25%, I personally, I think it's probably a little higher of patients with Chiari will also have hydrocephalus, either um, presenting that way or in a delayed fashion after the decompression is done. And the idea here is that there is a slow hydrocephalus and the brain compensates. And as the brain compensates, there's a downward force, which is what ultimately is calling this, causing the cerebellar descent. And the syrinx, we're going to go through that path of physiology. And I think it's, it's a lot simpler than people make it out to be. Um, and it makes sense because once you decompress and you open the frame and magnum and the CSF is allowed to flow, a greater than 80% of the syrinx will just resolve on their own. And there's a, a, a flow dynamic that's responsible for that. And this is this is a, uh, a cine flow MRI, which is a really great study. And that white you see pulsating in front and back within the frame and magnum here, this is what a normal uh, um, uh, posterior fossa should look like. And it certainly should, this is what after a Chiari decompression uh, is performed should look like. You should see CSF freely flowing posteriorly and freely flowing anteriorly. This blockage here, the cerebellar tonsils blocking this opening, the frame and magnum, this is where the symptoms of Chiari come. And the whole goal of surgery is that decompression. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the epidemiology. So the average age of pre presentation, again, for Chiari 1 um, in adults, it's about 40 years old. Um, I, I think the oldest patient I've ever treated was 83. Um, and, you know, the youngest, obviously, as you saw, can go down into the uh, Chiari 2, but, but certainly into um, uh, uh, young, uh, as young as five, six, seven years old. Um, there, there is a uh, larger female preponderance. The average age of symptoms that patients have before they're diagnosed is about three years. Um, if you include headache, um, it's seven years because, you know, headaches are very, very common and most people don't start getting a more detailed workup until later. Um, uh, presents again in adulthood, young adulthood, about 20% of patients will also have an associated syringal myelia. If that's the case, symptomatology is much, much higher um, because once you get to the point of a syrinx, there's um, particularly with headaches, there's some uh, um, pretty significant blockage there. And the syrinx in of itself will cause um, uh, uh, symptoms that we'll talk about. And as mentioned, about 20, in, in most studies, you'll see, um, you know, the average is about 25% or a quarter of the patients will present with hydrocephalus. Um, far and, and, and beyond anything, the most common symptom is pain. Um, and that's, that's really headache. I and mean, that's, that's the most common uh, uh, presenting symptom. Um, but it also will come down to uh, neck pain, girdle pain, arm, leg, and it can be very, very diffuse. And a lot of these patients become diagnosed with chronic pain syndromes, RSD, um, or, you know, just kind of uh, uh, psychosomatic. Um, you know, the headaches are pretty classic. And, you know, we always think of them in the back of the head. And I'm going to show some slides of why that is. But the headache can be anywhere. It can be frontal. It can be at the vertex. It can be behind the eyes. Um, but one of the kind of, um, you know, gold standard sign is anything where there's a valsalva, coughing, laughing, sneezing, straining for a bowel movement. Um, we get venous congestion. And during that congestion, as the venous sinuses expand, there's a further pushing and blockage of the frame and magnum. And that's where the headaches really come from. Neck pain, um, again, very common. 
um, hearing, tinnitus, balance problems, muscle weakness, particularly in the hands. Um, the thing that I focus on most in the office when I'm examining a patient are, are hands. You can see in more chronic forms, um, atrophy uh, in the thenar eminence, um, but you'll, you can sense uh, the weakness. You know, back before, um, you know, I, I feel older every day when I'm in the office because I ask me, do you have problems with your keys, your car keys or keys in the house? And most of the younger patients, which is all of them, look at me like I have two heads because nobody really uses keys that much anymore. But things like dropping a mug, um, hand coordination, holding a pen, writing for, for um, a period of time where the hand gets really weak, that's um, very, very common. Dizziness. You know, then you start getting to more vague symptoms, ringing, um, tinnitus, which is um, uh, actually not as uncommon as you'd think. Um, difficulty swallowing is another big one. And often, unless you ask them, they won't really bring it up They'll, because it's, it's usually towards the latter end. And by the time they're seeing you, they're experiencing these symptoms, you know, maybe a few months and they're starting to just choke on things. Um, this is the big one. So this is something that, that I've really been um, focused on for the last couple of years because, you know, my training and my early kind of, I, I think I'd put into to three categories of, of years of treating Chiaris was that, you know, people, I'm, I'm having a lot of brain fog, um, my, I'm, my memory's not there, and it's like, yeah, it's cerebellum, it's a brainstem, this has nothing to do with memory, it's the stress of all of this, it's the stress of the headaches, well, you know, as usual, um, our neurology colleagues uh, kind of figured this out a long time ago, something called cerebellar cognitive effective syndrome, which isn't that new. Um, and our neuropsychology colleagues as well um, have seen this. And with the advent of imaging and um, looking at uh, tractography, spectroscopy with MRIs now, three Tesla, and, and being able to really understand um, the tracks of, uh, and, and fiber pathways of the brain, there clearly is a cerebellar component um, to memory um, and, and some of the other cognitive issues. Um, and, you know, one of the problems is misdiagnosis and poor communication, you know, telling a patient it's in your head telling a patient that, um, particularly these patients, that, you know, it's just not that and dismissing it, it really makes it worse because they are feeling this. And um, even if it's not related to this, that really tends to um, add gas on fire. So kind of education and um, understanding really do help to reduce and relieve. Um, and this is really um, what we're seeing and having a better understanding from uh, uh, topography of understanding where certain areas of the brain, particularly the cerebellum, have functions that we really didn't know not that long ago. You know, there's executive function, emotion, language, um, clearly motor, um, but working memory. Um, and if you look at where these tracks go uh, with functional MRI, um, it really makes a lot of sense. And, and it was kind of this epiphany that, you know, wow, all these patients over these years that were having memory issues um, it's real. And this is also, you know, very important to illustrate why there is a, um, a having a multi true multidisciplinary approach to this is critically important. And often I will have um, Dr. Glebus, um, our neuropsychology team, uh, 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 you know, look deeper into this. I've talked to Dr. Gallo multiple times. And actually, we're working now on trying to get a protocol where we can kind of have almost a Chiari clinic where patients come in and kind of get this comprehensive evaluation and really more to start looking at before and after patients, patients that are having cognitive issues with a Chiari, getting a baseline after their decompression, um, looking at a certain time point and seeing if there's a change. And if you add spectroscopy onto this, um, I think this is a really important study. Um, so let's, let's talk about the signs. So the signs, meaning things that we see in the office, not that the patient's feeling, but things that we pick up when we examine a patient. You know, one of the more common things is uh, nystagmus. Um, you can see an upbeat nystagmus. Um, it really can be any, I mean, I, I, I tend to see commonly more an upbeat nystagmus, um, but there can be variations. Um, you know, the difficulty with gait, patients compensate because this is more of a chronic uh, a, a process. Um, but you clearly see uh, a subtle, uh, particularly more of a wide base gait. Um, 
what the patients will, will complain about when you'll see them, particularly when you have them turn quickly, um, is a position sense. They, they, they feel much more clumsy. There's often falls, but particularly you'll see them bumping into things um, or tripping on a staircase going up. Uh, those are common things I uh, ask. Hand atrophy, um, you know, just really grip. That simple, you can pick up. Um, weakness, especially upper extremities. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the cape-like distribution. And, and I think this is one of the things, too, that if you look in textbooks um, and you read about Chiari, most of the stuff that you kind of see classically from an anatomic standpoint, you really don't see in patients. I, I mean, I can count on my hands how many times a patient came in with a syrinx that could describe a classic cape-like distribution of sensory loss. Um, it makes sense anatomically. And I'm sure it's there, but there are so many other things that it's it's not as pure. And we'll, we'll go over that when we talk about um, what the, the syrinx is. Um, and then fasciculations, which you can see. And these are more chronic and later on. So like anything, the devil's in the details. So when you're examining patients and a patient comes in and is, is you know, being seen for particularly for Chiari malformation and has all these symptoms, it's really important first and foremost to, to let common sense dictate. So, you know, there's over, you know, hundred different types and variants of migraines, all of varying symptoms. So we have to keep that in mind just because somebody has a Chiari and they have headaches, it doesn't mean that there's a direct correlation. Pain is really common as well, um, but it has to fit a pattern. You know, it has to fit into a pattern that makes sense. Um, you know, I'll, I'll sometimes uh, talk to, um, uh, the patient and I'll have a double check with the nurse or, or the PA to go in and say, you know, ask them if their hair hurts, you know, ask them if they're, if their answer is yes to everything, you start to, uh, uh, to, to realize that, you know, it's not as focused and maybe not related to uh, what their MRI findings are. And for those of you that the non-clinicians, uh, you know, hair should not obviously have any nerve endings, so your hair shouldn't hurt. Um, weakness is usually specific when, when I, 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 it's not a red flag, but I, my antenna go down a little bit when I start hearing I'm weak everywhere. Um, and you have to differentiate that from fatigue. And if the symptoms really don't correlate, then the likelihood of the, um, outcome of a surgery is more likely than not, um, not going to be good. And I would tell you, um, just go on YouTube, go on Chiari and look at some of the patient groups. Um, I spend the first five minutes uh, with my new patients who have Chiari explaining all the horrific things they've seen on MRI. I mean, it's not uncommon where you're seeing patients that have had 20, 30 surgeries. Uh, some of the national meetings that we, we have, um, the ASAP group in particular, patients actually come to this. Um, and some of the stories are just absolutely horrific. And what that is coming down to is people trying to treat really a film and not the patient. So you really have to make sure that these symptoms correlate. Um, if the first surgery doesn't help with the diagnosis at all, like there's absolutely no improvement after the first surgery, um, it's really unlikely that subsequent surgeries, particularly, you know, uh, going back in and reopening, cutting, cutting out scar tissue, which really doesn't happen back here in this area of the brain um, is really, really unlikely. And it's also important, you know, to understand these patients become, um, you know, at least within our group, uh, they're lifelong patients. Once you operate on a patient, you don't just say, look, I did my surgery, it didn't work, go see a pain specialist, go see the neurologist. I mean, we follow them through. Um, and I think right now, probably the PAs are all grinning because, you know, they, they, they have to deal with these patients um, as much, if not uh, more than, than, than us and know that. So some of my, you know, some facts and some of my thoughts, um, 30, this is a fact, 30% of patients with a diagnosed Chiari by definition are asymptomatic. So again, gets back to the previous slides of really making sure there's a correlation there. No one dies of a Chiari. And sometimes Chiari patients don't like hearing this, particularly at the support group. You know, you hear the thing about I'm a, CR, a Chiari survivor. Um, you know, you're a survivor of a trauma, a patient's a survivor of cancer. Chiari is an anatomic problem with a fix. And I tell my patients, once we decompress, you no longer have a Chiari. Now, the syndrome is a different thing. If we chose the right patient and did the right surgery, the syndrome too should go away. Um, so we have to put that in context. 
And surgery is not a trial, it's permanent. That's why it's important to try a patient on um, uh, anti-migranous medications to try to work out other things because it either works or it doesn't. You take a medication and you have a side effect, you stop it and the side effects go away. Surgery is permanent. Um, so you really have to have a responsibility with that when you're committing a patient to surgery. Um, and you have to choose the treatment for the condition, not the symptom. Um, and, and this we're going to talk about. I think one of the biggest take-home messages that I can give is that the degree of herniation has actually really limited prognostic value. Um, you really have to put all the pieces together. So let's talk about treatment. And, uh, you know, I put probably five different lectures together into one to give a 30,000 foot view of this. And, you know, obviously a lot of lectures are just about surgeries and techniques, and, and I'm not going to get too much into that other than what the procedure is and what the goal is, um, which is really what it comes down to. So the surgery itself, I'll be very honest with you, is a quite simple surgery. Um, what we do is you can see the back of the, the skull here, and this is the frame and magnum. This is about the bone that we removed. Now, when I trained, um, and my colleagues trained um, back in the day, we would remove, uh, and we were taught to remove half of the skull. I mean, the whole back here would open up, we would open up, decompress everything, uh, did some crazy things, stuck muscle in the obex and the fourth ventricle, which was not a good idea because it really was poorly understood what the problem was. But we now know um, that it's really opening up the frame and magnum. And I can tell you now that the openings that we've started to do, and we're starting a series now, is even just shaving off just the bottom here and removing C1 to open this up. Now that in of itself is not going to take care of the problem. What that's gonna do is help open up uh, the frame and magnum. And we'll talk a little bit about the controversy of pediatric patients, adult patients, and what the final uh, a goal of surgery should be, or the final surgery should be. So before we get into that, I want to talk about the decision tree. Who should have surgery? So not all patients with Chiari need surgery. You know, patients need to be informed as we talked about, and the correct diagnosis is critical. So, um, you know, who? Radiographic evidence. Um, I will never operate on a patient unless they have radiographic evidence. The goal of surgery is to decompress. If you do not have blockage of flow of CSF at the frame and magnum, then I, there, there's no, nothing any surgeon can do to help you. Um, so, you know, the QRE zero in my mind is not a surgical candidate. Um, clinical symptoms that are specific, not um, nonspecific headache, fatigue, generalized pain, um, it has to fit a pattern. And to put it, to tell you to, to, to actually um, prove that Chiari, um, there's no guidelines and everybody is all over the place with who they operate on. Aetna actually has guidelines. This is the only real guideline out of carotid artery stenosis where we have good data. They have guidelines of what they'll pay or not pay for. So if a patient's being told they need surgery and you have Aetna, they're gonna tell you, we're not gonna pay for it unless you basically have MRI diagnosis and they go into specifics. Cerebellar tonsils greater than five millimeters, three millimeters in children, associated with crowding, compression of neural structures, or a, a, a syrinx. They also tell you what they won't do it for. Symptoms are related to headache, neck pain that you know has uh, a, a failed, uh, has not failed conservative treatment, um, sleep apnea. So all these different things that they're doing. So. The, the reason they're doing this is because uh, there's really no clear consensus and there's people that are being operated on that probably shouldn't be. So how do you make sense of this? You know, what, what, there, there's so many different paths and particularly for the patient. Um, you can imagine how many getting different opinions, going online, hearing different things, trying to sort out the Chiari for malformation in children versus adults, because a lot of that gets mixed up. So you really have to, um, I think, simplify things. And not all caries are the same. So this patient on the left, which I, I, we, was my first slide, this is a patient with almost exactly five millimeters of cerebellar descent and had horrific, horrific symptoms. Um, uh, ataxic, falling, horrible headaches, um, swallowing difficulties, ringing in the ear, um, and just on and on and on and on. 
and um, she had a decompression and I get a card from her every year. Um, uh, I think I did her like 2008, nine, somewhere around there. Here's another patient um, on the right. And this is a patient who was incidentally found. This is a pretty, you can see the cerebellar tonsils are down here um, and basically had headaches. We managed the, no other symptoms, um, no syrinx, no other symptoms, managed the headaches with medication and you know, didn't need surgery. So what are the goals of surgery? The goals of surgery are really quite simple. It's opening up the frame and magnum and restoring CSF flow. If you do not do that, you have not achieved your goal of surgery and the patients will not get better. And this is what, um, this is a, a intraoperative view. And these are the cerebellar tonsils. This is the dura that's opened. And we're gonna talk about that surgery. So the bone, that bone has been removed um, and the cerebellum is up here. Here are the cerebellar tonsils. Um, this is the uh, uh, brainstem and the uh, spinal cord here. And so you can see the cerebellar tonsils being down here, whereas they should be up here. And this is where the blockage of CSF is. So the goal of, of surgery, um, my surgical protocol is opening the dura, identifying the cerebellar tonsils and the pica arteries um, are underneath here. So you have to be very careful, make sure you visualize them. And we cauterize, and this is a very, very important point. We cauterize the cerebellar tonsils. We take bipolar cautery, we shrink them until they move up. They, they literally shrink and shrivel up to here. Take a bipolar cautery, shrivel, they go up to here. There's a lot of debate about this. Um, a lot of the surgeons and a lot of the, um, particularly the pediatric surgeons that are, are really adamantly opposed to this, talk about cutting the tonsils out and it's a bloody mess. You don't cut these out. You, the goal is to shrink them because if you cut them, you're gonna get bleeding. If you get bleeding, you're gonna get inflammation and you're gonna get scar tissue down the road. So there's a really big differentiation. Now, some people don't open the dura at all. They decompress the bone, they take off the C1 lamina and sometimes there's a thick fibrous band there and they'll cut it and then they'll just leave it. Again, um, there, there have been more and more studies done with this. Um, and the recurrence rate is much higher. So I, I strongly feel that those, that dura has to be opened and those tonsils should be shrunk. Is there any uh, level one evidence? No, and we're gonna talk about that. So again, the goal here is, you can see some here, there's absolutely no CSF going around here. This is pre, this is post. This is what it should look like post. And if you compare the two here, you see this, this isn't crowding, this is a peg, this is a cork in a bottle. And again, if I don't shrink, these are the tonsils here, compressing, you can see uh, the brainstem being compressed. If I don't shrink those tonsils and take them out, which they're, they're there, they're gonna still be low lying here. There's gonna be CSF space here, but over time there's uh, a higher probability that they're going to um, obstruct. So let's talk about specific patients. Um, and I think that always helps when you're talking about real people and real symptoms. So this is a 25-year-old female who was referred um, with a carry malformation, um, had, uh, I think it was six, seven, had a, had a diagnosed Chiari on MRI. Uh, she had really bad neck pain, um, was tired, starting to actually get depressed, um, would get debilitating headaches. She's had them since childhood, but around the time of her period, they would get a lot worse. Um, this is her MRI office visit. Um, she just started a, a really high stress uh, a job um, at a company. She was in Philadelphia. She got an executive position um, and she just really wasn't sleeping well. She hated her job. She was very stressed out. Um, and on exam, this is a very key thing. Her neck was really tense. Her MRI, the straightening of the cervical cord, that's muscular. Chiari does not cause, you shouldn't have tenderness in your neck from a Chiari malformation. It's, it's, it's more of a neuropathic type pain. Um, now you can see it if they're guarding or they're positioning their head a certain way to avoid um, headaches or pain, but for the most part, um, this is all muscular. Um, she has a history of childhood migraines, her mother had migraines, light sensitivity, loud noises. Um, her exam, completely normal strength, sensory is normal, gait's normal. She had hyperreflexia. She's a young female. It was symmetric. It was not out of the, the norm. So this is someone who, you know, what's the plan? Technically, you know, she had a Chiari malformation and, you know, the discussion could have been, well, let's do a decompression and, you know, whatever goes away, 
Uh, we know it was a Chiari, whatever doesn't, we'll treat. And, and that's not an uncommon plan. I see a lot of second and third opinions. Um, I don't think that's a great plan. Um, you go the other way around. So basically, um, her headaches were, she was on the right migraine medication, um, which she really wasn't before. Migraines were resolved, changed her sleep habits, got a new pillow, um, and everything started to get better. She ultimately changed her job. But, you know, at three months, it was night and day. Um, and sometimes patients just need to hear and trust you that it's not this, it's this, but we're going to kind of get you through the rest of it, not just say, oh, it's not this, go find another doctor. So let's look at another patient, 42-year-old female, uh, mild headaches, really not that debilitating, um, dropping things, um, was having neck pain, and really it was her unsteady gait and was starting to trip on things. And her primary care doctor is the one who sent her really for that. She wasn't really complaining that much about the headaches. Um, she thought it was lack of sleep and other things. Um, so in the office, um, you know, doing a review of systems, she, she did have tinnitus, which was new. Again, she was like, you know, now that you mention it, I'm, I'm really much more cautious about swallowing. And I, I, I feel like I, you know, I have to really work and concentrate on getting um, solids down and asking about the headaches. You know, she said she stopped, you know, particularly bending and lifting heavy things because the headaches got a lot worse. And on her exam, um, she had profound hand intrinsic weakness, no atrophy, but, but uh, profound hand weakness, decreased gag, um, was a toxic, particularly uh, on turns, um, and had a truncal ataxia um, and almost a titubation. Um, and her plan was surgery. Um, and again, that's the goal, you know, the before and after should look like this. And this is that patient, um, that I just showed you. So you really, again, have to put things in context and this is what it should look like after the surgery. You should have that free CSF flow. Whereas you can see here, there's no way CSF is getting around that in the left. And here you can actually not only see the white on T2 sequences, you can see the flow. So the Cine flow is a really, really good tool. And it's also a great tool to rule someone out. If someone has low-lying cerebellar tonsils, it's equivocal, you I'll often get a, a cine flow and show the patient that, look, you can see the fluid is flowing around here. My goal is to open that up to get the fluid to open. It's already open. I'm not going to help you with surgery. So why is there so much controversy? Um, so what's the definition of Chiari? Um, most people will start off with five millimeters of descent. And most people that, uh, most of the surgeons that treat this, they'll throw in a lot of other things. Is it a Chiari syndrome? Is it, you know, again, let's talk about the Chiari zero. Is it just a syndrome? Is it not radiographic? Is it five millimeters? Is it seven millimeters? Do they have to have, is it headaches alone? Some people won't operate on Chiari's with just headaches. So there's a lot of um, uh, uh, controversy on even what it is. It's, it's incidental. Um, it's about 1% actually of the population, depending on what study you look at, um, in incidental, uh, where it's just seen on MRIs without symptoms. Um, symptoms are common symptoms like headache, pain. Um, and then this is a big debate, peds versus adults. They, I've always felt very strongly that these are different diseases and they're different. Um, you cannot look at them the same. And, and, and even the surgeries, I think you have to look at a little bit differently. And um, Robert Keating, uh, Bob Keating, who's um, a pediatric neurosurgeon, the chair at uh, Washington National Children's, um, and I are, are a part of the ASAP group. And for a decade, we would have these conversations. And he was actually one of the few pediatric uh, uh, colleagues that, that agreed with me on this. And, and so we did a... Um, uh, uh, this is actually about to be published in um, uh, the Journal of Neurosurgery Pediatric, uh, looking at comparing uh, 170 adult patients and 153 pediatric patients um, over um, a 20-year period. And what it basically showed was that pediatric and adult patients significantly different in terms of demographics, radiographic findings, presentations, symptoms, surgical indications, and outcomes. Um, so you know, they are different. And this is, I think, one of the first really good studies that's multidisciplinary, multiple centers um, that, that, that shows that. Um, so any study that we talk about, any decision, and for surgeons, it's critically important because if we're going to perform surgery, 
we have to have levels of evidence. We have to have data to support that what we're doing is the right thing or the wrong thing. And, and if you ever want to get really scared, look at the data for spine surgery. <laughs> and uh, you, you'll see it's quite alarming, um, which is why there's so much controversy in spine surgery. Care is no different. So this is just a really brief reminder that you know, we have levels of evidence um, for uh, data uh, to suggest doing something or not. And it's from level one being the highest, which is a randomized controlled trial, a meta-analysis with same results, um, with controls. Um, that's really, really rare. It's a high strength. Most of the stuff that we do, quite frankly, at the best case scenario um, is level three. And you know, the recommendations are, you know, class one, it's recommended. Um, and then you get into should be considered, may be considered, and then just outright is not recommended. And you'd be surprised at how many things are done in medicine that are class three that are still being done. Now, this is not a hard and fast rule either, because there are certain, many diseases where there's no great answer to, and the, the data is crap. So that's where the judgment has to come in. But this is a guideline. For Chiari, we're in class 2B at best. Usefulness is less well established by evidence and opinion, it may be considered. Um, so that's why we really don't have hard and fast rules. So what does constitute a Chiari? Uh, five millimeters, three millimeters, is there a syrinx? Um, you know, almost always a syrinx along with the Chiari is pretty much a slam dunk. Um, sine flow, is there obstruction of CSF flow? Um, symptoms, do the symptoms correlate? And, you know, really the answer um, is yes to all of these. There needs to be some form of uh, obstruction at the frame and magnum. Syrinx plus minus, but if the syrinx is there, it, it, with the carry, it immediately goes into that yes category. Is there blockage of sine flow? If it's there, yes, it goes into the, that category. And then symptoms 100%, the symptoms correlating with all of the above. I do have some patients that have severe blockage on sine flow um, with syrinx, and they're really relatively symptom free. Um, I, I have two patients in particular, one I've been following um, for 15 years. Um, and as she gets older and the symptoms actually get less and less because there's more room there for the CSF. And she has a pretty significant uh, syrinx, but just absolutely does not want surgery. Um, and again, these are, these are one-off patients. So by no means is that um, you know, standard, but it does show the variation. So some of the controversies and things that I did want to go over, because these are things that I get asked a lot and we get referred to a lot. And even some of my colleagues, um, you know, within GNI are like, hey, I have this patient. They have this. There's that. The OBGYNs are asking. So pregnancy, if you are pregnant and you um, uh, have a Chiari and you're symptomatic, um, you know, what do you do? Do you do the surgery? What type of pregnancy can you have? Um, can you have a, a vaginal delivery? So this is this too has evolved over the years. So what we have to understand is Valsalva. We talked about that earlier. Well, let's look at the anatomy. So in the posterior fossa here, and actually throughout the brain, but really the posterior fossa, you see the transverse sinus, the sigmoid sinuses, and then coming up, you know, the torcula and the uh, um, uh, sagittal sinus. These are big veins. And when you, we laugh, we laugh, we cough, we bear down. So think about a vaginal delivery. Um, I can't say that I know what that is, but imagine it if you have not done it, you are bearing down constantly. Those veins are engorging and engorging. Now imagine that you've got a significant Chiari with brainstem compression. Um, there are, I can count on my hands where um, we've had emergency calls from patients that have um, uh, become unconscious, they've become paralyzed, they've become bradycardic, and it's usually temporarily during uh, uh, deliveries. So that, that's the cause and the problem. So do we tell every single uh, person that don't get pregnant until you get surgery, don't, um, you, you know, you can't have a vaginal delivery? No. Um, the general census, and there's some data here, um, and everyone's a little bit different. My practice is if a patient is asymptomatic um, and they have a Chiari, regardless of the descent, if they are asymptomatic, um, without a syrinx, I will, they can have vaginal or um, uh, C-section, and I'll write a letter for that, um, and they're getting a block, obviously. Um, and if they have a syrinx um, or they're symptomatic, I tend to have that recommend a C-section. Um, and I think more and more people are doing this, I think, which is important, um, because, you know, to, to just 
have to commit somebody to a C-section with very little data and just to kind of, you know, cover yourself, uh, I don't think is fair. This is another big one, you know, return to sports. When do we, when can uh, uh, someone return to sports, particularly contact sports? And this is something also that's really evolved. Um, if someone's asymptomatic, I'll return them um, with education of what symptoms are that, you know, um, and be very clear, if you have a concussion, that concussion may be worse um, than if you did not, patients that don't have Chiari's and, and make sure that they and the parents understand that. If they're symptomatic or syrinx, they avoid contact sports. Um, and I'm pretty clear about that. Um, opening the dura. So that gets into another you know, controversy here. Do you open the dura? Do you just remove the bone um, and close the skin and say we're done? Um, or do you open the dura? Do you, do you shrink those tonsils? Um, do you just open the dura and not shrink the tonsils? So the data on this um, is actually getting uh, uh, clearer and clearer. And I think you know, some of the conversations that, that we have particularly with our pediatric colleagues are, and, and I did a ton of these at CHOP, um, they do great. The kids do great if you just don't open the dura, you don't do the tonsillectomy. The problem is, is as they become adults, um, a lot of them will then become symptomatic because you have to think about a 10-year-old or a nine-year-old, and then when they're 20 and they're 30. Um, so the general consensus and the data, um, you know, again, very soft data shows that opening the dura and tonsillectomy lowers the rate of recurrence with, and you get a much better improvement of a syrinx and headaches. However, the downside is that there's a higher short-term complication. And the biggest one is a CSF leak, um, pseudomeningocele. Um, and a lot of that comes from scarring and, and there's a lot of other things. And you have to say, you have to be very clear that you're not cutting those tonsils out. And I don't know that there's ever a study that's been done to show with just a, a shrinkage, but there is a trade-off. What type of patch graft? So when we open that dura up, we sew a patch in like a quilt to make that room much bigger there. Lots of different patches are used. Some people will use patients, the, their own fascia, They'll take grass from an abdomen, from the back of the skull. Um, some people use, uh, which I tend to use, bovine pericardium, which is a, a basically the a covering of the heart of a cow, which is a sterilized. Um, and there's other types of uh, synthetics uh, um, that, that are used. Um, there really is no major difference in material, but if you use something that is not from the patient, there's a, a, a slightly higher incidence of that kind of inflammation and pseudomeningocele. But 90% of them are not clinically significant, meaning they don't need resurgery, they don't need, it pretty much goes away on its own. And this is, this is kind of what it looks like. So this is the opening of the dura. There's those cerebellar tonsils, low lying, and all of this here that you see this glistening, that's the arachnoid. Um, some people make an argument for opening everything else and leaving the arachnoid intact. Um, the problem is, is you get even a tiny pinhole they're gonna end up with a big CSF leak down the road over time. Um, some people do this, um, but um, most people, if they're gonna open the dura, will sew a patch in here. And again, I will take the arachnoid down, shrink those tonsils up so you can drive a truck through here and sew a patch in. We're looking at right now, just doing a real minimal um, opening here um, and making that even smaller. So syringomyelia, I'm gonna finish with this. Um, this is a lot simpler again than people make it sound. This is the fourth ventricle. Here's a central canal in the spinal cord, which you often don't even see on MRI. Um, and this is where the syrinx develops right here is the central canal. When you get a blockage of flow, you get increased CSF pulsations and the syrinx will form. And this is what a syrinx looks like. And this is a pretty common, and you can see that the ribbon of spinal cord tissue um, that you get, it's, it's, it's amazing that these people can walk. But if you look at the, the fourth ventricle, you can see this then comes into expansion of the central cord. And what you see is, and this is really, and a really elegant study was shown that basically there's a piston, the cerebellar tonsils act as a piston at the frame and magnum. So during systole or valsalva, there's this kind of almost violent pushing down and you get this piston down up and then in di diastole, it goes up. And what that does is, is the, with the fourth ventricle and the connection to the central canal, it kind of causes this pulsatile until that canal expands. And that's why once you open this and the cerebral spinal fluid, this piston, so to speak, is not 
constantly going up and down and the CSF is around, what happens is the syrinx, the pressure in the center of the syrinx is less than the outside CSF. And then the CSF will slowly diffuse out of that syrinx. Um, and that's what you see. So now during systole and diastole, you see the CSF going around as opposed to being blocked and going through the fourth ventricle. Um, so facts, 70% um, of them are associated with a Chiari. There are traumatic components and um, you know, those generally don't do well with surgery and, and doing an opening of the frame and magnum doesn't help. You have to rule out a cystic tumor. Most important point, if anyone's seeing a syrinx, you have to get a contrast MRI because they can mimic, uh, uh, cystic tumors can mimic this. Um, uh, trauma is a second most common cause, basal invagination less so. They cause pain, sensory loss. It's a dissociation of uh, a pain and temperature. You'll see patients that will burn their hands on a stove and kind of not know it. Um, that's kind of a common finding. Uh, weakness, again, particularly in the upper extremities. And if you look at where this is and where the fibers are, it makes sense. The sensory fibers are medial. The motor fibers are lateral. That's why you, the technical early syrinx, you're supposed to get this cape-like sensor uh, distribution. It's always really well mapped out in the textbooks. Haven't seen it that much. Alternative treatments, very important. I mean, things that, that um, I think are um, important to look at before we offer surgery. Medical marijuana helps. We just did a study, um, which I just gave uh, uh, presented um, in Chicago uh, this summer. Um, it is astounding the amount of patients that, Chiari patients, that benefit from medical marijuana. And most of them are using it. And I'm talking 70 year olds, older patients. Um, it's really figuring out the right strain, the right dose um, for the right symptoms. So that, that's not going away. And, and our early data from the grant showing that it, it really does help. Acupuncture, physical therapy, headache manage. These are the steps that have to go through um, for patients that are just having headaches and Chiari. So in conclusion, there really is evidence lacking for clear data-driven guidelines. Um, you have to use common sense and look at every patient as an individual. Um, Chiari is not a uniform disease. Um, I do think we have to start looking at it as more of a Chiari syndrome as opposed as a surgeon looking at it as a syndrome and not just a, a malformation or anatomic defect like an aneurysm. Um, each patient has to be evaluated individually. Um, there's no universal protocol and the importance of professional organizations to get data, like the peds versus adults data, the medical marijuana data, the opening the dura or not opening the dura data is critically important. We have to start pooling our data through these uh, uh, professional organizations. With that, I will end and I will take any questions. I think I stayed out of time. Dr. Vest, thank you very much. It was definitely a great talk, and I can just tell that by the by the number of questions we're getting. So I'm going to just jump directly to the questions. Okay. Um, what would be the indication for treating a syrinx specifically with a surgery beyond the decompression of the Chiari? So the to with if there's no Chiari in a syrinx. No, no, no. Uh, I, if I understand correctly, the question that, you know, uh, if there is a syrinx to treat, the, you do the decompression of Chiari. Is there any specific clinical scenario where you would actually intervene surgically into the syrinx itself? I see. That's a great question. No, because it's really remarkable. Some of the worst um, syrinx, um, and, I, and I actually should have showed some before and after slides, greater, almost 90%, once you decompress and that CSF opens up, they go away on their own. And oftentimes, if it's chronic and large, you'll still see a little cavity on MRI, but the symptoms are gone. So it's kind of more anatomic and you don't have to um, uh, uh, treat it. Very rarely, if it remains and it's symptomatic, you can put kind of shunts in them and things like that, but that never ends well. So pretty much we don't do much with them. Okay. If you have a mild case of care and it's not meeting for the criteria for surgery, or at least not yet, how do you treat that type of patient? By symptoms, another great question. Really, by reassuring them that you're not going to die, you're not going to wake up paralyzed, you're not going to, um, and really close follow up. Um, the symptoms, if they, they're either the same, better or worse. And that's the first thing patients that I'm following in the office. My first question: How are you doing? Same, better or worse? Um, so uh, really, it's just managing their symptoms. Um, now. It, you know, again, that the, the patient will normally dictate that, um, but it's managing the symptoms. Nothing bad will happen. 
this is probably more of a statement than a question about the Chiari one that it's clear the where the controversy is this, because as soon as you you know you label something you sound thinking and then you, you might start missing other diagnoses so it's definitely a, a very gray area I guess the Chiari one Chiari zero <laughs> yeah the Chiari zero it's I, I mean in my opinion and again just my opinion I think it's crazy um because we're not talking about a definition we're talking about Chiari zeros that are surgical candidates. Yeah. So you're operating on somebody with Chiari-like syndrome symptoms that have no obstruction at their frame and magnum that, that don't have uh, any cerebellar descent. So yeah, like, I would agree. It's like almost sounds like multiple sclerosis without demyelinating lesion or something like that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's exactly right. Um, so it's, it's uh, yeah, I, I think hopefully the data will pan out that that, you should never operate on those patients. Um, you, you showed initially the dynamic MRIs. Um, is it needed uh, in diagnosing? Is it, you know, do we need to get those or, or it just was more for illustration? No, another great question. I get them frequently. So I don't get them automatically on every patient. Um, I will get them um, when there's a question. So if it's a borderline, you know, the symptoms kind of are there, but they're not horrible. There's five millimeters of descent. That really helps guide me. So if I do, then I'll do a cine flow. And if the CSF is flowing there, I pretty much just put it away and, and the patient feels better. Um, it does help with diagnosis. Or if a patient has a decompression and symptoms recur, I'll get that. And if there's no blockage, if there is blockage, then we know there, there, there's an issue. So I don't get them automatically, but I will get them frequently. Where can you get the, the dynamic, the one, the upright, and you know, the, the, the supine and as well as the CNFO, can you get it at any MRI facility or the right? Yeah, actually, you know, Crozier, uh, John Healy and, and, and Morgan and uh, um, Abby have done, and, and uh, Abby Deans have been great partners and they do specific sequences for Chiari, uh, like T2s, things that a lot of other places don't do. Um, so most places that do high volume and comprehensive do, but Crozier, uh, will do it. Um, uh, Oleg Teitelbaum at, uh, Mercy does it for us in, in a special thing, but you have to specifically ask for the CINE flow. And here's one of the problems. The radiologists don't get reimbursed for it. So a lot of them just will either pretend they'll do it and not do it. So you got to make sure they do it. Chiari and LP, lumbar puncture, any contraindication? Because I, and I've actually encountered my, myself, you know, the, uh, several people with LP, they had Chiari, which was asymptomatic. They get LP, it really becomes symptomatic. So Great question. No, I, I, um, that's one of my, um, uh, that is something where I've seen disasters. And again, um, that's where cine flow can be helpful because if there's no obstruction there, you know, you don't want to do a high volume. But in general, and I'll tell you one of the big problems are the pseudo tumor. I have patients that have pseudo tumor with slit ventricles. The diagnosis for pseudo tumors in LP, but they also have a Chiari. Um, so you know it becomes a, a, a difficult. But yeah, a, a lumbar puncture is a contraindication in a Chiari patient for sure. Yeah. So what should we do? Let's say we we suspect meningitis. It's it's you know it they need it's you know it's not a elective LP or something like that. What what do these people? What, what are their their options? So you know everything is a risk benefit, right? So I mean, if somebody has a, a real clear and the answer is, have we done LPs? Um, I've personally done them on patients with mild Chiari's. Yes, but the goal is you want uh, the smallest needle possible and you want to get like five cc's at most. Um, really where the herniation comes with, you know, like a two-e needle, if you're doing lumbar, things like that, where a lot of CSF is, it, it's a, 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 you know, negative pressure in a very acute uh, uh, fashion. So you want to get as uh, limited as, as possible. Um, and if it's serious enough with meningitis, we can always go in and, um, you can, you can do a ventric, you know, we can get it from a ventriculostomy, like the pseudo tumor patients. I'll just shunt them. Okay. Dr. Vest, thank you very much. It was a great, great talk. Uh, a, a lot of interest in it. And uh, for all of our uh, listeners, uh, uh, we'll be looking forward to uh, welcome you again in a couple of weeks. We'll have Dr. Detinyaki from University of Miami talking about epilepsy. Have a, have a good day, everybody. Great. Thanks, everyone.